Hello everyone and welcome back to my Realism Overall series in Kerbal Space Program 1.1.3. In this episode, I want to get some data on the Centaur Nico 3. By the way, it's 3 because there were two other configurations before I came up with this one and both of those were viable. But um, the Centaur Nico 3, we need to get some data on all the engines. And I have been told by comments that we cannot do that with a static fire test, which is really annoying. Um, so I also I, I had some ideas about how to do it, but apparently the way we're supposed to do it, which is sort of sad, is just this R and D thing which tasks scientists to do it. Um, part flight data meets or exceeds maximum lab R and D amount. Okay, well th I, that wasn't the part that we had a problem with anyway, so that's okay. Those are reliable. It was actually these guys. Um, Hmm. Okay, so I sense a bit of a problem with using this R&D button in order to do this because uh, part flight data meets or exceeds maximum lab R&D amount here too. And uh, let me guess for these engines. Oh shoot. Not what I wanted to do. Uh, let me just toss one on quickly. Don't worry, I have another idea. Uh, this, this one we could hire a team for. Okay, well we might as well. Uh, let's hire a team for 90. That's hardly any data units, really. I mean, we're talking about we need lots and lots. Well, research cycle lasts one day, but then I'm going to have to go on and on about it. But okay, well, we're hi we will hire a team um, to research this engine. But uh, I, I thought that there might be another way to do this uh, with recoverable boosters. So now the thing is, I don't want to do it in... Uh, uh, illegitimate way. We could just use stage recovery, have a parachute on the booster, launch it and parachute down and it might be safe and we could recover it. But I thought about doing something slightly more complicated involving some mods that aren't technically RP0 compatible but I tossed them in anyway. And uh, first of all is the is the infernal robotics parts and these are the reworked models and you can see non RP0 but uh, it's a reasonable purchase cost and we've got advanced construction these are basically construction parts uh, and I'm not planning to use them in space yet uh, this is uh, you you okay so what am I gonna do with this um, well you know what let me just build it and then show you how about that uh, I don't think I have done what I set out to do what I think I have done here is create a single stage to orbit rocket with a single RD0210. It doesn't have any payload to speak of, it's just got the parachute and the controller and a battery and then the rocket. Uh, it might not even be able to communicate back. But, hmm, the Payload, I guess you could call it, is 0.4 tons. Uh, we could build it in five days. If we took off the parachute and put something light enough, maybe we could like launch it like CubeSat sort of thing. This is not what I intended to do. But what if we had this engine and the uh, NK9V uh, it would be actually better to use the NK9V first, but it doesn't have as much thrust. And then make a two-stage rocket, though maybe the one-stage rocket is much more interesting. Though I don't think the two-stage rocket would take too much extra time to build. They're pretty cheap, and then get data that, that way. Anyway, let me think about it. This should be interesting. Before I get ahead of myself with SSTOs, let me show you what I was actually intending. Uh, here we have the pistons and little flotation devices from the USI um, survival pack it is, the survival pack. So what we do is we extend like this. Okay. And then we inflate the flotation devices so that this can float on water. Now you might ask, all right, well, why don't you just land it on land and use landing legs? Well, that's because the landing legs are placed in the tech tree. 
And so I didn't have much leeway there because it would be cheaty of me as far as the RP0 tech tree is concerned to uh, add landing legs to a different part of the tech tree so I could unlock them earlier. Uh, in fact, we don't have any landing legs unlocked. We have fixed landing gear somehow, but no landing legs, not even a micro landing strut that comes later in the tech tree. But nobody said we couldn't have floats. So I decided that we would have floats. And, so, and of course that's more convenient also because we'll probably end up in the water. If we don't end up in the water, I have no idea what happens. Maybe these can survive on land, I doubt it. I think they'll pop. Now, in order to avoid having too high a thrust weight ratio, I've actually got a tank of lead ballast here. So basically there is, whoop, no, not there, here. Hmm? I'm pretty sure I put a tank of lead here. And it shows the lead there. I mean, it shows the mass of the lead there. It shows the lead ba ballast here, but it doesn't show the... Hold on. Let's say add lead ballast. It doesn't show it as a bar here. Okay. That It doesn't show it as a resource. But anyway, it's in there. Uh, and that's just to weigh it down so that it doesn't have too high a thrust to weight ratio. Uh, when Because otherwise it's going to go to orbit or something. Uh, so two minute burn time and all of that. So that's the idea. We should at least try this out. We will uh, build one of these. It'll take 15 days, though. So that's a little bit annoying. Uh, th that's just to test one engine. But we'll see what kind of benefit we get from it. And remember, we can't um, we can't use the R&D thing for this engine. So that's that there. Now, while that flotation idea was my original idea. Uh, now that I've seen what kind of Delta V we might be able to get from these rockets, it would be wrong of me not to try to do some sort of SSTO with it. So, let's, uh, we have this tiny little, really tiny little satellite. It's got two communitrons, solar panels, uh, one of these early controllable cores. Its own mass is 0.122 tons. Um, I put a little 1 kilonewton thruster on it just to see how much Delta V. It's probably got 200 to 300. Um, it's got these attitude jets, those are going to be its primary propulsion instead of a uh, 1 kilonewton thruster. It's got the basic instrumentation on it and uh, not much else. So it's sort of like, it's not really a cube sat, it's sort of a pyramid sat or something like that. But then we've got the fuel tank and then uh, the controller and then a really, really thin battery and then another fuel tank uh, set to 89% utilization. UDMH and N204 for the RD0210. Uh, so yeah, that's another way and I'll have it burning for three minutes, which is well under its maximum burn time. You can see the sea level thrust there. Um, yeah, so this could probably get into orbit if nothing goes wrong. That's a big if, obviously. Uh, yeah, and what about the other engines that uh, we have to test? Well, this is the one for the NK9V, which is obviously not supposed to be a ground engine, but we need to test it. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, uh, it seems a little bit costly for such a tiny satellite to orbit, but you have to take into account that the satellite itself is 2,000 funds. The entire rocket is only about 800, so it's pretty cheap altogether. Um, the controller is a little bit expensive, then there's just a tank and an engine, right? So... Yeah, it's not a bad setup, but only a tiny little uh, payload, so it's not something you'd want to do unless you were really wanting to test the engine. But this is an interesting way to test the engine. Uh, not as much delta V as with the other rocket, or uh, sea level thrust weight ratio, a little bit more burn time, and uh, we'll be relying more on the little thrusters on the payload to finish up orbit in this case. But it's the same payload. Uh, so 2,000 funds. If I had made a cheaper payload, it would have probably built much faster. Uh, the most expensive part of the payload is the early controllable core, which is 1,158. Um, if I want the payload to continue to be powered and still have a full avionics control, I don't have much choice. If all I wanted to do was have the instrumentation, though, I could use the Explorer 1 probe and that could easily be tossed up without any trouble. 
Yeah, and it doesn't even consume much electric charge, though this has its low power mode. It would have to be in low power mode to continue on with just those solar panels that we've put on there, by the way. It is not uh, receiving enough power to be in full power mode all the time. Anyway, so that's the NK9V, but we do have the NK9 as well. The NK9 uh, is better off on the sea level, and so we'll take a look at that. Here it is, and as you can see, it has 200 more delta V because it's got all the extra sea level thrust and sea level ISP, and uh, its initial thrust weight ratio is also higher. Now, all these rockets have a very high final thrust weight ratio, so that's going to be interesting. We'll see if Smart ESS can hold that, or whether I have to, or something like that. But anyway, I'm going to build one of each of these, and we are going to see what happens. I think that's an interesting way to go about things and to test the engines. I don't know if it's the best way, but it's an interesting way. So I've got the rockets in queue in reverse order. I think the most interesting one might be the dynamic test article, just because of the floats and everything. Uh, so we'll go in reverse order. The easiest one in theory is done with the NK9 at the bottom. So I'm going to warp to complete. This is sort of like going back to the days of the of the sounding rockets, except uh, whether they're sounding rockets or not. They, they, they certainly don't have the feel of a sounding rocket. They're more of an advanced test here, I think. I'm a little bit worried that we're wasting our time, given the fact that we need to be ready for the moon mission, but this, this, this could be useful, could be useful. And if it turns out it works, then we might have to do it with other engines as well, like the NK-15s. Okay, here we are. Uh, I'm not going to time warp to daylight or anything, because that's just going to waste some time. Well, maybe it won't. I guess we should actually have this window up to see... I wish I could resize it. Mm, the flight HUD doesn't really give much information unless something bad happens. Anyway, uh, just note, uh, call it 1,250 data units and we'll see how it goes after that. Okay, throttle up, SAS on, ignition. Yeah, no data units at this point. So it only gains data units after you release the clamps. Now it could do some clever little things about that, but I guess we should just make... I wonder if, if you release the clamps but the thrust to weight ratio is, you know, uh, holding at one or something, it's hovering above the pad, whether that would count, don't know. We have no way to c correct a roll here. Uh, we might be flattening out a little bit too fast. I might be deceiving myself with the high thrust weight ratio later on. It's not really a high thrust rate ratio now. We do have a roll. I just hope it doesn't go too fast. A lot of the delta V comes in the last minute of burning this engine. Hmm. It's gonna be a little bit tough to handle. At least we're not spinning any faster. But we might have some intense heat. I think this throttles down, doesn't it? Let me see. Nope. No, it doesn't. Okay. Not like the NK-15s, then. Ah, we had engine failure. Engine shut down early. We got 750 day units, so that's good. But as far as getting our payload to orbit, not so good. Uh, we have plenty of fuel left over. Interesting. No ignitions remaining, so this is just gonna fall in the water. Nothing more we can do. Possibly the, the given this way of you know, the fact that it's likely to feel like this, maybe the parachutes and floats is a much better idea. Because the probability of us actually making it to orbit is rather low. 
It didn't really have that much burn time left. It just had a whole lot of Delta V left. The Delta V was all stacked to the very end. Okay, well, anyway, uh, well, I can't space center it yet. I guess I have to follow it all the way. Interesting to see it orient itself. Um, how is it going to end up? That's important for the floaty one. We need it engine side down, actually. Of course, the floaty one has a parachute, but it's not really doing a good job of... Oh, maybe Smart ASS was fighting it, but then it doesn't have a reaction wheel or any RCS on to do that. Hmm. I don't know uh, the way that... But it was going rather fast. Yeah, so I'm wondering about how the, the dynamic situation with the flotation one will go. Okay, well, it's coming down at 120 meters per second. It's not going to survive, I don't think. Okay, nope. No recover vessel. Alright. Space Center. At least we got some data, but I swear the mean time before failure doesn't seem to work out very well. That was pretty quick on the failure. Anyway, let's finish the next one. Now mind you, I understand what mean fi a mean time before failure means, but we've had a failure with that exact engine recently and the probabilities are getting a little bit tight at this point that we should have so many failures so quickly with it. Okay, it appears that we will also have a nighttime launch with this one. This is the NK-9V, that first one was the NK-9. I, I don't know why my throttle is flicking around. It should be reading my joystick throttle, which is all the way up. Okay, now it seems stable. Maybe. Okay. No, it's, it's still flicking. Ignition. We're at 2,500 data units with this one. Mean time before failure, 60 minutes. Looking good so far. Yeah, this might get a little bit hot here. I don't know. If I could shut down and restart it, that would be great. But no ignitions remaining. Now we're going high though, okay. Oh, it's going too high. I'm gonna need to point down a bit. A lot, probably. Uh, well, it's serviceable, I think. All right, we've got plenty of time on our hands. Uh, fairing set. Gonna you know, throttle down. Uh, little satellite separation. Okay, little satellite has separated. I'm gonna let the little satellite rotate to prograde first. Uh say or, uh, orbit prograde but I'm gonna let it do its thing since we're just floating up to apoapsis we've got all of five and a half units of Arizine and N204 now obviously without the payload I think the rocket could have made orbit also if I had managed to pitch a little bit better Okay, here we go. The only question is how much delta V do we lose by the little thrusters being angled like that? Oh, it looks like it's going to take more than 200 based on our orbital velocity right now. Uh-oh, there seems to be an imbalance. It's tilting one way, but... Okay, well, we're going to see. More than halfway through our fuel, periapsis. Well, it's getting there. Remember, most of the delta V is going to be back loaded here. 
But it's not gonna be enough. Close, but no cigar. Negative 157 kilometers. Noble effort, though, I think. Noble effort, and uh, unfortunately we don't still have a read on how much data we got on that engine, but I, I'm sure we got some good data. Alright, let's try the remaining one, which is the RD0210. Okay, it's trying to give me night time again, but this time I'm going to go with daylight. Okay, here we go. Throttle up. SAS is on. And ignition. And launch. So this is sort of in the middle of the first one and the second one in terms of Delta V. The second one, the one that actually made it closest to orbit, actually was the shortest on Delta V. Now since the second one didn't actually experience heating, maybe I can be a little bit more aggressive with this one and thereby get a better chance for orbit if the engine doesn't cut out, of course. I'm happy to report that all these rockets control just fine without fins. Just a little side note. Okay, here we go. High G-forces. I don't suppose this one throttles. No, it doesn't. Lots of shaking from 8 G's now. 100 kilometers, 10 G's, 13 G's, sorry. Pitching down. Well, we ended up uh, even shorter, a higher apoapsis. I don't know how that will help or hurt us. My guess is probably hurt us. But here we go again. Let's try for it. Okay, we are right on prograde here. probably be in the middle of our burn right when we hit apoapsis so can't get that part any better I forgot to get a read on how many data units we got from the test well we'll check that out in the VAB now yep, I think we will end up with about the same deficit hundred and forty three kilometers uh, negative hundred and forty three kilometers on the periapsis so yeah this one will re-enter too so uh, sort of a failure though the fact that we burn through the burn time of the engine means that the engine testing part of it will be a success you know we got the data points and all but you know any attempt to launch a satellite and keep it in orbit uh, not so successful alright well uh, that leaves the the floating one. Okay, here we go. Throttle up, SAS is on. And this should be entertaining. Let's see. Ignition. And launch. So we've got 4,300 data units on it so far. I am going to tilt towards the ocean so that the floats work. There is, of course, still the question of whether it'll orient properly initially or whether it'll break apart under aerodynamic forces. That's a separate issue. I didn't put RCS on here or anything, and there's lead on the front. <laughs> so it might be a lawn dart sort of situation, come to think of it. Maybe I should, I should have probably put the lead on the bottom, huh? Yeah. Okay, mm yeah, it's already uh, it's already going lawn dart on us. It's going very fast. But at least it made it through the burn. And now I've got 190 minutes mean time before failure. I suppose we could have tossed uh, an experiment up instead of having the lead there. Well, in addition to the lead, I don't think any experiments could possibly could possibly weigh that much. 
Yeah, it's going pointy and down, that's for sure. Okay, come on, drag. Get some drag on this thing. It's wiggling about. That That's good, right? Should help it to slow down somewhat. The parachute's not going to survive the heat. Maybe. Yeah, forget it. Okay, so that didn't work out. No way to test the floats like that. Maybe a slower test would have been better. But then again, we wouldn't have gotten... Wait, there's still a parachute somewhere. Um, yeah, there's still a parachute here. Well, I can't tell it to deploy. I should have uh, done the pre-deployment thing and armed it. Now, it's just a little parachute and it can't deploy. That's sad. It could have saved itself. Anyway, uh, but yeah, if I hadn't uh, sent it as high up as I did, the engine test wouldn't have lasted as long. But anyway, this has been uh, instructive, I guess. We explored the world of non-Hydrolox SSTOs, which is conceivable, not, though not very useful, as you can see. Um, yep. Uh, certainly, if you tried to recover the SSTO, you wouldn't be able to do that. Because the equipment to recover it, like a heat shield, would weigh more than the payload that we had on top of it. So, so then you'd be in trouble. Heck, even a rudimentary RCS would have weighed too much. Okay, vessel destroyed. All right, back to space center. All right, so next time, what I want to do is uh, try out the Nico Three again. And, uh, well, we'll start at building, and then we'll turn to the Aphrodite, which will be entering Venus SOI due to science there. Unlock the necessary sciences for the moon mission, including the lander legs, really important. And uh, then we'll launch the Nico 3 make sure that it works reasonably. And if it doesn't, then we're going to have to think of something else, some other kind of rocket with more reliable engines. Alright, so that is the plan going forward. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.